Okay, so in today's lecture, we're going to talk about two aspects of the actual postnatal brain development. We're going to first talk about experience-dependent plasticity, and the second one, we're going to talk about the role of nutrition during development. Now, let's take a look at the structural development in the cerebral cortex. Last time we talked about uh, the cerebral cortex being the seat of many functions in the brain, right? And so this is equating with um, many aspects such, such as perception, motor, cognition, and along with uh, many other um, forms of cognition. Okay, so let's take a look at the cortical development that is going on, for instance, in the visual cortex of humans. So this is the a Golgi scene that you are seeing. So what you're seeing here is on the left is the newborn and then on the middle this is three months old and then on the right you're basically seeing a six months old. And what you can appreciate is that the complexity of the neurons are really increasing in terms of the um, the morphology. No, morphology is meaning the shape of the neurons, okay? So the morphology of the neurons, they are really going from uh, relatively simple in the newborn to more complex in the three months old and then uh, to much more complex in the six months old, okay? And right then you can kind of see that Oh, it's because they are developing, and that is the reason why the complexity of the neurons, they are also getting better. And then you'll see that this equates with their visual perceptual abilities as well in, the, um, in their vision. Now, let me start with the term, what is neuroplasticity? So plasticity really refers to the nervous system as modifiable, so it's malleable. So it's kind of like plastic. You can kind of bend it, you can shape it. So this is the term neuroplasticity comes from, okay? And so this is when significant experiences that cause the brain to rewire, and this is also called uh, experience-dependent plasticity. So before we kind of go on, I want to first talk about just the normal trajectory of the developmental timeline. Then we'll talk about experience dependent plasticity. Okay. Now in this picture, what you're seeing is a simulation of what the babies do see when they are developing. And this is based on what we know on the retina development as well as the uh, visual cortex development, okay? So what we can kind of appreciate is that as a newborn, you don't see that very well as you can kind of uh, see from this. All you kind of see is a very blobby, um, you can see like some sort of a contour, but it, it, and honestly, you don't really see that very well, okay? Now at four months old, you start to see some contours and then you can see the near sight pretty well. So let's say the mother here is closer to the bed, but the father is pretty far away from the bed. So uh, in other words, uh, you can see the mother uh, like relatively well, but you can see that at this point, the color vision is not really well developed yet. Okay, so this is why you can see a hint of color, but it's not as vivid as what uh, you would normally see. And I have to point out that a lot of the detail has not been filled in yet, okay? So the baby cannot see things like the far uh, far stuff very well, but they can see the near stuff relatively well, and their color vision is not 100% developed yet. And now let's take a look at six months, okay? So at six months, what you're basically, uh, what the baby are seeing, they can see the further stuff start to, they can, you can see that a little bit better. And then they can also see, for instance, they can see color also a little bit better. So now you can appreciate that at seven months old, um, they can see the father who is a little bit further, a little bit better. But 
they, there's a, still a lot of details that they do not see. For instance, the stuff on the wall on the left here, it's still absent, um, relatively absent. Now at 12 months old, their eyesight is pretty much as good as what uh, ours is, okay, as adults. You can, now at 12 months old, they can really see this stuff really, really well. And uh, the far stuff, like for instance, something that you couldn't see before, this, um, this bear that is very far away, or um, the hanging that's on the wall that is pretty far away. Before, at seven months, they cannot see, but now they can, so they can see that pretty well. So at 12 months, their um, vision is uh, completely developed, okay? And then, and what you can kind of appreciate is going back to before, this really correlates with the actual development of the neurons in the cerebral cortex, okay? Now, in the previous slide, what we have really looked at is the uh, increasing of the neuronal morphology during development. Okay, so that's only one side of the story. Now, after when they get to the peak of the actual neuronal morphology in terms of development, there is a process called pruning, okay? So the pruning, this is the sign of um, neuronal maturation. So what you can see here, uh, now this is in mice, okay? Uh, this is the work that we published uh, a while ago. You can see that um, in mice, when they go from 30 days to 90 days, there is an increase, right? But shortly after that, there is a decrease of the actual uh, neuronal morphology in terms of the how, how long the dendrites are. Okay, so you, from over here, you can kind of see that it follows a uh, inverted U shape. Okay, so it goes up and then it goes down. And this is true for everywhere in the cerebral cortex um, uh, across development. Okay, now, not only this is the case for the, neur for the neuronal morphology, but this is also the case for the synapses that we talked about last time. So before I go on, let me just remind you what synapses are. Synapses are where the neurons connect with each other, okay? And then as you learned in Psych 101, there is a presynaptic terminal that's usually um, the axon boutons. And then there is the postsynaptic terminal, and this is usually the dendritic spines, okay? And then, and then uh, in between there, this is a synapse, okay? So this whole thing is synapse. And between that, there is a synaptic cleft, and, and the, synap the synaptic cleft, this is where the neurotransmitters go, okay? Now, what is synaptogenesis and synaptic pruning, as we said before? What well, synaptic genesis is the massive synaptic growth that happens. So you can see that, uh, and I want to, I do want to bring out that like different kind of uh, cortis, cortex has different kind of synaptogenesis area. So for instance, you can see that the sensory motor cortex developed earlier, and then followed by the, the, the parietal and temporal association cortex, and then the prefrontal cortex really develops last. Okay, and but everything that I've told you before is true, that there is a peak synaptogenesis, okay, that happens first, and then this follows synaptic pruning, okay? So this is when the development uh, really is critical for both synaptogenesis period as well as the synaptic pruning period. And so this has the name of, um, the, hence the name critical period. So once you get to this age, uh, uh, 14 to, to 16, you, your synaptogenesis as well as your synaptic pruning has ended. And so what does that mean? That means that not that much can really help you uh, modify your plasticity that much anymore, okay? Okay, uh, now last time we talked about dendritic spines, right? Okay, so dendritic spines, if you remember, if you go back to the previous slide, dendritic spine really is where the postsynaptic sites are, okay, for excitatory synapses. So the dendritic spine density, what happened during this 
pruning process, they are going to gradually decrease during development. So what you're basically seeing is that at postnatal day 30, this is in mouse again, okay? So in postnatal day 30, the number of the dendritic spines are really, really high, right? So it doesn't really matter if it's apical dendrites or if it's a basilar dendrites, okay? And you can see that they start to progressively and gradually decrease for both parameters, okay? And so what this means is that this dendritic spine pruning is a very important step when it comes to the actual maturation of, in terms of the synapse development, okay? Now, let me go back and bring out this idea of experience-dependent plasticity, okay? Uh, so experience-dependent plasticity is a little bit different from the developmental plasticity, okay? Developmental plasticity is that if you just kind of let the animals run their own course, and what kind of plasticity are you able going to see? So in other words, the developmental plasticity really is looking at the normal development of, um, of a person. So this is more looking at the nature side. What is hardwired, okay? Now, the experience-dependent plasticity is something completely different in the sense that we are now looking at how environment as well as how all these different experiences can really cause a organism to uh, exhibit plasticity in their brain, okay? And now there are many different kind of experiences uh, that neuroscientists do when they are trying to study experience-dependent plasticity. So I will, I will kind of briefly tell you about all of them, okay? Now, one of the things that they do a lot is they would do something called monocular deprivation to look at how the segregation of the ocular dominance column uh, occurs. Okay, now under normal uh, experiences, what you see in adults is something that looks like this in, in B, okay? The ocular dominance column. Okay, and then, so this is, this means that the innervation from the left eye comes, and then the innervation from the right eye comes, and then they are organized very orderly in left, right, left, right, left, right fashion. Okay, and this is not the case in neonates uh, up here in A. Okay, so this, in neonates, they're, they're not segregated. Okay, but then, so what happened is that if they do something like one eye suture, okay, then what they found is that the ocular dominance column in which that it, this is organized in left, right, left, right, is completely goes away. And then the one that gets the innervation, so for instance, the left eye is covered, okay, and the right eye is receiving a lot of the input then the information that is coming from the left that is in the ocular dominance column where it's supposed to be is not there anymore. And instead, the, the, the places that were supposed to be the left eye now is completely again getting occupied by input that's coming from the right eye. Okay, so this is basically how monocular deprivation can be used to study ocular uh, dominance columns uh, to also study experience-dependent plasticity. Now, last time we also talked about this example, okay? Um, this is how the peripheral manipulation can actually change um, brain representation, okay? And we talked about in uh, the, this is in the cat monkeys, okay? So what happened when they take away the third with the middle finger then what they saw uh, over here, okay, and then what you can see is that there is a reorganization in, of the somatosensory cortex in which that the third finger representation is no longer there. You can see that the, the uh, digit two and digit four basically took over where digit three was supposed to be, right? Now, if they give them stimulation down here, if they give them stimulation down here uh, to stimulate digit two and digit three, and then what you can see down here is that 
the digit two and digit three cortical areas uh, increased, then they expanded. Okay, so this means that the stimulation caused increased cortical area while the deprivation or the amputation decreases the cortical area. So this is the concept of you use it or you lose it. Okay, you use it or lose it. And then this has a name of that. The, the guy who found this, uh, actually coined this, his name uh, is Donald Hebb, okay, H-E-B-B. Uh, -B. And then so uh, this way, uh, so he coined the term use it or lose it, okay. And then so this is what we usually refer to as Hebbian synapse or Hebbian plasticity. Now, a very popular model they also use is the whiskers to barrel system. And then they use this as a very popular model to study cortical developmental changes. So what is the whisker to barrel system? Let me just kind of briefly tell you what it is. Um, mice, they are nocturnal animals, right? And then think about the environment that they live in, usually like dark tunnels, right? So they don't get a lot of light, but uh, they, but they, they really need to rely a lot on their sense of touch. Okay, so the thing that they, for them, they are really, really highly developed and is their whisker system. They use the whiskers to navigate their environment. Okay, so when they use the whiskers to navigate the environment, their uh, whiskers really are their eyes in this case. And so for them, their whisker system is very, very highly developed. And the sensitivities on the whiskers is kind of similar to the sensitivity on our fingertips. It's really, really sensitive, okay? They can sense vibrations that's coming from the environment. They can locate objects just by a, a slight touch of the actual um, whiskers. And so this is for them, this is the way for them to really navigate the environment, okay? So kind of very quickly, um, just, let me just tell you that uh, there are whiskers on their face and then the information can kind of get transmitted to the base of the follicle and from there uh, through like a very uh, complicated process which I'm not going to tell you they end up in the primary somatosensory cortex in their parietal lobe okay and so this is what uh, now the, the reason why this is called barrel cortex is because if you were to look at them kind of from an eye uh, a bird eyes view, and they look like um, barrels, uh, wine barrels, okay? So this is why they are called the barrel cortex. And there are several reasons that um, a lot of the scientists used to uh, study developmental changes, and, and that's because the first one is it has a very well-defined anatomical pathway, okay? And the second reason is that it has a, a very highly um, topographical organization. Okay, so what do I mean by topographical organization? organization. It means that uh, one barrel responds to one core, uh, one whisker, okay? So for instance, this barrel over here corresponds to this whisker, okay? So it's very well organized. Um, and then, so you can basically, you can touch one whisker on the face and you can see the corresponding cortex area in the barrel cortex is the one that is going to be lit up, okay? The third reason is uh, the ease of manipulation, okay? So what you can do is you can stimulate the whiskers, right? Or you can just, if you want to do sensory deprivation studies, you can just remove the whiskers. Uh, so this is a much more humane compared to um, eye sutures. This is much more humane compared to uh, finger amputation that you saw from before. So uh, the whisker trimming or whisker plucking uh, in which that the scientists just pretty much uh, get rid of all the whiskers, this becomes a very popular model for sensory deprivation studies. So what is the result of sensory deprivation when you take away a whisker? for instance. So let's say here what they did is they took a row of the whiskers away. Okay, so they took away the C row. And basically what you are seeing is that 
all the entire C row disappeared. Okay, and you can see that uh, this is where this is the actual staining of that. The entire C row uh, is not is no longer looks like barrels, but rather it looks like um, a, a jointed. Uh, amount of cortical matter, and then they're they're also a lot smaller compared to the neighboring feral cortex, right? Now this one is an even more striking uh, result. So this is the result from the monocular deprivation induced plasticity. So uh, on top, what you're seeing here, this is the row. Uh, this is the this is the uh, the normal kind of um, ocular dominance columns. So you can kind of see that this is a zebra stripe, right? One has the, so, so the stripe and the stripe. So, so what they did here is they injected some, some radio isotope into the eye and then that, those radio isotope gets um, travel up to the, to the cat's brain. And then, so then they look at, they scan the brain and then they look at basically where the, the radio isotopes are. Okay, and you can see that uh, in the normal non-deprived animal, the ocular dominance column is very, very well uh, maintained. So what you're basically seeing is zebra stripes, right? But in the monocular deprivation down here on the bottom, what you're seeing is that that zebra stripe basically went away, first of all, and then on top of that, the zebra, the information that's coming from the non-deprived eye pretty much invaded into the deprived eye. Okay, so this is the monocular deprivation induced plasticity. So what this means is that peripheral lesions as well as peripheral ma manipulation on the sensory organs has a great effect on uh, the development of the cerebral cortex. In other words, the environment as well as the sensory activities really shape this, uh, um, this idea of what, how your cerebral cortex develops. Okay. Okay, now let's talk about environmental enrichment. Uh, environmental enrichment, a lot of people also call it EE is also a great way of manipulating the environment to see how the enrichment of environment can have an effect on the neurons. So how do scientists do this usually? But scientists typically do a enhancement of the caging environment. So in typically in the in standard environment, what you see is that they will only have access to food and water. Okay, now in enriched environment, EE, what you basically see is uh, increased environment cage. So you can see that the size of the cage is bigger, first of all. Second of all, you can see that the number of the animal is greater. So over here, you only see that there are two mice. And over here, you see that in the enriched environment, there are four mice. This means that there are more social interactions that these uh, mice in the EE environment that are getting. Okay, that's the, that's the second thing. The third thing, what you are basically seeing is that there are a lot of toys. Okay, you see that there are wheels, there are balls, there are tunnels for these mice to really run through. And that's a really great thing. And then there are like ladders, for these mice to climb on. Now, one thing I want to add for the enriched environment for EE that is that uh, the way that we do it in, in my lab is that we constantly change the environment around. So we would um, add stuff and take away stuff all the time. So which means that this is not a stable environment, but rather this is a constantly changing environment for the mice. And this way, there are a lot of novelty, a new environment for these mice to go through at all times. And this actually is going to make sure that they are not just having a rich environment, but they are having a constantly novel environment. Okay, so what does this, 
have an impact on the neurons. All right, so down here, what we're seeing that this is the a, a neuron in the hippocampus. Okay, so you can see that in the enriched environment, the neurons they look very elaborate, and they have a lot of dendritic fanning, and the processes are really uh, going out. Okay, and as opposed to the standard environmental. Uh, the standard environmental uh, hippocampus neurons, you can see that their environment, uh, the standard environment really is causing the neuron, that the, the neurons to be not so complex, okay? So one of the things that we know about the dendritic processes is that it has, it pretty much increases that your capacity for this neuron to do a number of things. Okay, and as you saw from before, in when neurons become more complex, the acuity, like let's say the sensory acuity is better. So now hippocampus is important for aspects such as memory, and then remember where this, um, this mouse has been, and also like general consciousness, uh, but because it, takes a, it plays a very important role in memory consolidation. So which means that these mice uh, that are going through the in, uh, enriched environment, they are most likely smarter compared to the animals that lived in the standard cage environment. Okay, so uh, the effect of the environmental enrichment on neurons as, uh, as what we saw is that uh, the neurons become more complicated and then they are able to process more information. So the previous slide is showing us how does the environmental enrichment impact the dendrites in the hippocampus. In this slide, what I'm showing you is how does the EE environmental enrichment impact the number of synapses in the brain. Okay, so here what we're looking at on the right in panel A, this is showing you the hippocampus apical, apical dendrite. And what you see here on the top view, this is the standard cage condition, okay? And on the bottom, what you're seeing is the enriched environment, okay? And right away, as we, as I mentioned before, um, the dendritic spines, these are the post-synaptic terminals, okay, for excitatory, uh, for, excit for excitatory synapses. So you can see that the enriched environment the number of the dendritic spines is much more compared to the standard caging. Okay, now you're probably thinking that why is this thing um, green? Well, because the reason why they're green is they're labeled with something called the green fluorescence protein or uh, GFP for short. Okay, now this is a marine protein that was found in the uh, in Massachusetts, and then they actually found this in a jellyfish, um, believe it or not. So, uh, so this, uh, so what happened is that in this flor uh, fluorescence protein, under a very specific emission of laser light, they are going to start emitting this bright green, and it's really beautiful. Okay, so uh, right now neuroscience is using a lot of the GFP as a standard to investigate. Uh, the structure of the neurons. This is the way that they they would um, label the neurons. Okay, now, so as we saw before, the number of the dendritic spines, which is the proxy for synapses, excitatory synapses, are increased following living in the enriched environment. And now in panel B, what they're kind of showing you here in the x-axis, what they're showing you is the standard caging versus the EE caging. Okay, and then on the y-axis, they're showing you the density of the spine. So this is why you're seeing the number of spines per micron. Okay, you can see that the density of the apical dendrites in the CA1 region really is increased after the EE compared to the, uh, in the standard housing environment. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that there are more connections that are being made uh, in rodents that are living under the EE environment. 
Okay, so that also means that the capacity for these neurons to really perform computations are much greater compared to uh, the, the standard housing neurons. Okay, now this later on, you'll, you'll see that you're probably thinking that why do they look at in the hippocampus? Well, the hippocampus is, uh, is an important place that really plays an essential role for memory, especially memory consolidation. Okay, and then it also plays like a lot of other roles, but then the, the main thing that it does is memory consolidation. Okay, now if you kind of equate memory as intelligence, well, later on when we talk about intelligence, you'll see that memory is an essential part of intelligence. Okay, so you see that the, uh, the neurons that has better capability of remembering more and processing more in the memory area is going to equate to, somewhat equate to, this animal has higher intelligence quotient, or IQ, okay? So which means that the animals in the EE condition, more likely, they are more likely to, to be smarter. They will learn quicker, and then they are going to, um, uh, they, they're going to display much more uh, signs that they they are smarter as well. Okay, this is something that we'll talk about later in the lecture as well. Now, in this slide, let's talk about the gain and loss of synapses, and also how does the experience can actually perturb, enhance, or disturb the the number of the synapses. Okay, so on the y-axis, what we have is the number of the synapses. This is the dependent variable. Okay, on the x-axis, what we have is the developmental timeline. On the left, we, we have something like birth. Okay, uh, on the right, we have something like aging. Okay, <clears throat> so now let's take a look at um, this normal trajectory of development. This is something that we have that you have seen in the previous slide. What we know is that it first goes through a peak synaptogenesis. I'm going to point this out. It goes through a peak synaptogenesis, right? And then after that, it goes downward and, and, and we can see, we can term this as synaptic pruning. Okay, so this rising phase is the synaptogenesis, and then this circle part is the peak synaptogenesis, right? And then this falling part, that is synaptic pruning, okay? Now, environmental enrichment is going to increase the number of the synaps synaptogenesis, and, but it does not actually um, like affect the synaptic pruning that much. And then there is a reason for that. And later on, uh, if we have time, uh, or if you're interested in doing the office, I'll tell you that right now we know a lot more about the gain of spine as well as the loss of spine. The enrichment of, uh, the, the enrichment uh, environment really causes the gain of spine and the loss of spine to kind of accelerate in both ways, okay? But the gain of spine, the survival of the, the spine that is gained is a little bit more compared to the loss of spine. So gradually, what you have end up with is something that has more dendritic spine, okay? Now we have also talked about sensory deprivation, okay? So sensory deprivation, <clears throat> if you kind of start after this peak synaptogenesis, then you can stunt their pruning, okay? But sensory deprivation does not really impact the number of the spines that are formed during that synaptogenesis um, age, okay? Now, if you restore the sensation, um, like after you have with the sensory deprivation, what you can have is something called the catch-up growth, okay? You, as you can see that the slope does not follow like a normal sensory deprivation, but this slope is trying to like quickly catch up with the normal developmental line, okay? Now, so this is like the very, e not easy, this is like a very simplified version kind of tell us what is the number of the synapses as a function of all of these different 
experience dependent plasticity um, that an organism is going through. Now, looking up to what you have seen so far, you probably are thinking that, well, I'm really kind of past that synaptogenesis stage. Yeah, uh, and you, yes, you are. And you're probably also passing that synaptic pruning stage. And you're probably thinking that, well, is there other ways for me to kind of insert more dendritic spines or to make more synapses in my brain? Is there a way I can kind of make myself smarter in many ways? And uh, it turns out that there is, and this is called physical exercises, okay? So they've done this study where they compare the sedent uh, sedentary lifestyle versus exercising lifestyle in mice, okay? And so they, they did this while the animal is about postnatal day 33, and then they'll, they'll look at this, the, 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 the dendrites again at P postnatal day 30, and then they'll look at this again at P50, okay? So what they're looking at here mainly is they're looking at the number of the dendri dendritic spines that are inserted that preferentially stabilize. So in other words, you can see that over here, there is no dendritic spines, right? But in, in P23, but in P30, this dendritic spine grew out, okay? And at P50, this dendritic spine stabilized, okay? So which means that it remained at P50, okay? So they're looking at this number of dendritic spines, the survival of newly formed spines. So, uh, so they, they would do this in sedentary lifestyle versus exercising lifestyle. And, and what you can kind of appreciate in the quantification in panel C is that the number of the newly formed spines, well, well, the percentage of the newly formed spines, excuse me, it went from 30, I would say 35%, all the way up to 60%. Okay, so nearly doubling the amount of the dendritic spines that are new, newly formed and survived. Okay, and so what this means is that there are going to be more new spines that can be preferentially formed and stabilized if you exercise a lot, which uh, if you think that the number of the synapses in your brain really kind of equates to how smart you are, then you will want to exercise um, more, okay? Now, I know that we have talked a lot about things like exercising, and later on we'll talk about nutrition, and I do want to throw out a cautionary tale, okay, which means this is kind of for you to kind of make sure that you're not doing in, in, in the wrong way. Exercising is a great way to really promote the growth of new spines as well as the survival of these new dendritic spines, but, but, when you exercise too much, okay, to the point that you are like exhausted all the time, this is very bad for you as well. And why is that? There is something in your body that is called, that's called um, cortisol. And that is, you might know this as a stress hormone. This is very bad for eliminating the number of the dendritic spines in the brain. So you're probably thinking, what do you mean very bad? Well, when you give animals cortisol or if you stress them out, a lot of these dendritic spines, they would disappear. So that, that would equate to what? That would actually equate decreased capacity processing for these dendrites, which means that mm, uh, you, got, uh, you got dumber, okay? So you don't want to exercise too much to the point that you are releasing a lot of cortisol into your blood system. Okay, and then because this blood system, uh, this cortisol is gonna travel through the blood <clears throat> and then they're gonna travel up to your brain and then they start to basically attack these dendritic spines. And that is not you want. So you want to exercise to a point that you feel good and then you're not exhausted. That is the best way to really promote um, this increase and in survival of these new synapses, okay? So in the previous slide, we were looking at the survival of the new spines. Okay, so here let's take a look at the 
the elimination of the the existing spines. So it, we can see that they they still do this the same way. They look they're looking at the sedentary versus the exercising. Okay, and you can see that the number of the spines that are eliminated is greatly decreased in the exercising condition compared to the sedentary con conditions. Okay, while it does not really in impact the formation rate. Okay, so basically from here, you can see that the spines that are not being eliminated as quickly, A, eh? and on top of that, the new spines will be preferentially stabilized in the exercising. And all of these, both of these conditions is going to help you maintain more dendritic spine. Okay, so which means that they're going to make you smarter. So exercising is definitely a good way to go. Now let's take a look at the brain damage and recovery. So what we know is that the children have better chance of recovering from the loss function than do adults that suffer exactly the same damage. And so for example, that the children with the language area damage in the brain, they generally recover their language functions, and, but adults that su suffer exactly the same damage do not. Okay, and this is because the other areas of the brain take over the language function in children, but not in adults. Okay, so the, so what is the, the point here? The point here is that children, while they're young, because they have this help of this additional synaptogenesis that are occurring, they can recruit other brain areas that were not supposed to, that was not destined for language functions to really take over and become language centers okay but adults they do not adults they're kind of like well too bad you know uh, all my brains are already preset in what their um, functions are so you cannot take this area away and try to make it a language center no way you cannot do that okay now let's take a look at what are some of the cellular reasons why this does not happen in adults, but recovery in children is much more likely. So what is different in, a, in the adult and the children's brain? So it turns out this is something called the extracellular matrix, okay? So what is the extracellular matrix? Uh, now, for instance, this is something called the perineuronal net. And so you can see that the, the red, what you're seeing is the nucleus on, uh, on the right panel. And this green part, this, this literally looks like a net, okay? So these are the extracellular matrix. They are living outside of the cells. And then they are lattice-like structure that surrounds the, uh, that surround the neurons, okay? That's the first thing. And then they, so these are believed to be the cellular breaks that limit plasticity, which means that uh, when, when, when you kind of think about it, that would kind of mean that during uh, childhood, you don't have a lot of them. And at adulthood, that you have a lot of them. And that's why the plasticity goes down in adulthood. If that's, if that's what you're thinking, you are absolutely correct, okay? So in the presence of these perineuronal nets or the extracellular matrix, this makes the synapses much harder to form and will eliminate during the adulthood, which means that this perineuronal net helps stabilize the synapses and make it less likely to become modifiable. Okay, so now I told you before that the number of the perineural net that is in the extracellular matrix is not really present in very young animals, and but increases as they start to grow up. Okay, and this is exactly what this figure is showing you. Okay, uh, so the red part, what you're seeing is the perineural net. Okay, so at P10, so uh, so what you're basically seeing that is that it's like these small dots. These are the perineural nets. Okay, so uh, so you can kind of see that in P10 we don't have that much. You can maybe like one, two, not not really not not that much. 
at P uh, post natal day 14 and panel B, what we're seeing, we start to see a, some emergence of the perineural net, okay? And at P28 in panel C, we start to see a little bit more and so forth. And now, uh, so you can see that in D and F, they're pretty much really um, present. And you can see in this uh, circled part that it's really come to like full throttle at um, postnatal day 70. Okay, now let's take a look at the quantification of the perineural net densities at panel F. So at, day, uh, at postnatal day 10, we don't see that much uh, perineural net, net, net densities, right? But at 14, you start to see a little bit more. And then at P28, you start to see a lot more. And at P42, you see even more. Okay, and this is true for all cerebral cortical layers in that is showing you in panel G. What this is telling us is that the number of the perineuronal nets increase as animals mature. And this is especially true in the cerebral cortex. Also in other areas of the brain as well. But you know, because I, I, I focus a lot on the cerebral cortex and also because the cerebral cortex is really like the best learned model and this is why I'm showing you this as an example. Okay, now this maturation of the perineural net is related to limiting the adult plasticity. Now you're probably thinking that well if is there a way to kind of remove these um, perineural nets? Uh, now if there's a way of doing so then does that mean that we can take away the break and then we can restore plasticity. Well, if you are thinking that, uh, I definitely invite you to join my lab because this is exactly what I am going to be studying uh, when I open my, my lab at, um, at DKU. And this is something uh, we're really trying to understand. Is there a way to kind of, um, for adults to really recover um, things like after a stroke, for instance, or after some sort of fracture, or after some sort of brain damage, can they regain their function? Because as we, as I told you guys before, in adulthood, we don't have to regain a function following traumatic brain damage that much. But in young, in juvenile, um, we do, okay? Now, as I said before, um, so if there is a way to remove the perineural nets, uh, then in an in, in adult brain, can you restore the plasticity to juvenile levels? And it turns out you can, okay? Now, so the way that they do this by is to by administering an enzyme called the Chase ABC, okay? And when they, uh, when they inject this to the adult brain, they were able to dissolve away the perineuronal nets. Okay, so a lot of the lab, including my own lab, is going to be investigating how targeting the perineuronal nets as a way to restore function in adults with brain damage. So this is something that um, if you are very interested in doing so, uh, you can come and talk to me. Uh, but not this semester, of course, because I start in July. Okay. Now let's take a look at the growth and maturation in children. Well, I mean, I, I know that I say children, but we're really talking about uh, from the first year to the 20 years. Uh, so we're looking at weight and then we're looking at height, okay? And you can see that um, boys and girls uh, up until puberty, uh, around 13 or 14 years old, so, uh, the weight and the height is about the same, okay? And now let's take a look at weight first. Uh, you can see that before puberty, males and females are pretty much generally in the same line. The, the, so the trajectory is pretty much exactly the same. Uh, girls are in the red and boys are in the blue. And you can see that after puberty hits somewhere around 14 or 15 years old, and you can see that weight, body weight start to really um, become separated in which the girls are going to weigh less than the boys. And as you guys uh, know this, this is common sense. And so as 
the the height okay so you now somewhere around 14 15 years so you can see that um there this is uh, the point of separation okay now so this is the growth curves um basically looking at the 22 um a 2 to 20 years um based on large uh, national samples of children across the US now this is going to be slightly different based on the country and I think in China, it's, it might be pushed a little bit to the uh, maybe 16, um, because I think one of the things that we can know is that uh, they put a lot of hormones in U.S. food, okay? Um, and then there are a lot of like ad additional hormones in there. So uh, there's always premature growth in U.S. children. Uh, and which is, of course, not that great compared to uh, like other countries. But anyway, uh, I remember when I first moved to U.S., uh, my growth spurt happened somewhere around 14, while my friends back in Taiwan are still uh, not growing uh, that much. Uh, and I really have no idea uh, why it was uh, until later on, I... There is always a hearsay where there is a lot of um, a, a hormone that are being added to the milk in the USA. And I think that is why uh, I also kind of prematurely grew uh, compared to other, uh, my other Chinese or, or uh, other Taiwanese friends uh, that are back in Taiwan, uh, back in China. So anyway, that is uh, that's how how it is. So you can see that in other countries, uh, this is going to be slightly different compared to um, also be because of genetics and stuff like that. Okay, some some culture or some um, race they mature a little bit earlier, and some mature a little bit later. And then and as some this is something I want to point point out. Uh, so this is another place where you see nature and nurture kind of come together and and collectively can influence the growth and maturation as well. Let's talk about the development of food preferences. So the food preferences are a primary determinant of what we eat throughout life. And some of these preferences are really clearly innate. So one thing that I really do want to point out is that, for instance, uh, when infants come in contact with something that is sweet, they would have a smile, okay, and then they would coo and it's very cute. And then when they come in contact with something that is bitter, they have some, they will give you a face that, that they clearly do, do not like it, where some of them would just start crying, right? And then, of course, there are uh, some other taste such as sour or salty and these has some more kind of like mixed uh, mixed results okay so for instance sour some infants respond very positively to that and some respond very negatively to that and salty food uh, they don't really come in contact until later on around four months when the infant start to really develop this taste buds. Uh, so uh, something I do want to say, not all the taste buds um, are immediately developed. Okay, so the sweet and bitter, these are the ones that are developed a little bit earlier compared to other tastes such as salty um, food. Okay, now, uh, now the newborn strong preference for sweetness really is really kind of reflected in both their positive response uh, and the fact that they drink like a larger quantity of sweetened water than like plain water. And you see this the same thing in, um, in animal research. So if you kind of want to know if an animal likes something, you just see how much of the water they drink. And then uh, mice or cats or dogs and all of these animals, they would tend to drink more sweetened water compared to just regular water. So this is something that is very innate, that is uh, the same across all animals, okay? Uh, and also humans, of course. 
Okay, now the transition out of the primary, uh, primarily liquid diet to like kind of like a solid food, it really presents a lot of challenges. So most children, they demonstrate something called the food neophobia. Okay, neophobia means some uh, neophobia means something that you're scared of something new, and then children when they are switching from a liquid diet of mostly milk um, to a solid food they are um, they they will demonstrate uh, food neophobia and this is an unwillingness to eat an unfamiliar food now one thing that i want to say that this is something that is usually very frustrating for the parents because they this is the time you really have to um, train your kids taste bud and to kind of make them sure that they will like healthy food later so something that a lot of parents do is that they found out that oh um, my child really likes sweetened food and then as soon as he or she starts crying I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with him or her uh, a piece of like a soft candy and just just to make sure that he or she stops crying. And this is something that's very bad because because the the, the children they're gonna start to learn that oh that means I just need to have fit and then I will have uh, something that is tasty. And I have to say that usually usually something that is tasty is not that healthy for you. And this later on is going to have some bad repercussion or some bad consequences when it comes to the weight or the body mass indices of the children. And there are other risk factors uh, such as obesity that can, because uh, of course we know that when you have a lot of tasty food and then your stomach and your um, taste bud gets trained this way, you will eat only this kind of food. And then unfortunately these kind of food doesn't have that much nutri uh, nutrition in them. And then what happened is that um, the, these children don't, they don't develop very well. I mean, they, they will develop in terms of the amount of meat and um, fat that they have. But then in terms of the, the necessary nutrient they really need to develop into a healthy child is really lacking. So this is something that is um, something, this is something that obviously not good for, for the child, okay? So it's really important to make sure that you don't have, you don't train your kid to have like a positive reward or a negative reward with, with like the punishment when it comes to like healthy food. So you definitely do not want to make your uh, children think that, okay, uh, I, I am going to get used to e eating a lot of candy and then this is a reward and then eating something healthy is a punishment because in the long run, they are going to have a very unhealthy diet. And then that is going to basically ruin their lives, you know. So that's something that that I definitely urge you guys uh, later on when your parents don't do this to your child. You should um, give them something that is healthy and then try to avoid giving them something that is not healthy, if that makes sense, okay? Now let's talk about childhood obesity. Now when we think about childhood obesity or just obesity in general, right away we think about the United States of America. And that is because of course US really is the fattest country in this entire world in which about a third of the population are overweight. Uh, maybe not to the point of obesity, but then uh, overweight, which means which is defined by uh, the BMI over 25. Okay, now one thing I do want to bring up just in the context of the childhood obesity is that this is not just a USA problem. Now, according to the World Health Organization, about 42 million overweight and obese children are overweight and um, uh, worldwide and then uh, a lot of them are de in developing countries so such as uh, for instance there the amount of the um, children in africa 
under the age of five who are overweight or obese have nearly doubled since 1990 from 5.4 million to 10.3 million. And this is the, uh, these are the data back in 2016. Okay, so this situation exists largely because society and over the world, they are kind of increasing adapting a Western diet of food, uh, as you can see at uh, McDonald's or Burger Kings or Wendy's. Um, I personally don't don't eat them, and but I have to say that I do see more and more of that in China as well, and a lot of the um, uh, the, the the students, especially uh, the young kids, are also kind of eating more and more of that. And what is the result? Well, the result of that is, of course, you are hearing that, oh, I gained weight, I need to lose more weight. So I have to say that I'm not saying that you cannot eat something like McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC, um, but this is not not good for your body. And then, and why is that? Because a lot of these food that have, that they're all deep fried. And then what happens when you eat like deep fried? fried food, there is something in your body, it's going to create a lot of um, inflammatory signals. And this is very bad for your body in the sense that it will first of all, make you age a lot faster. And second of all, it is going to make you gain weight like crazy. And it's not just because um, fat has a lot of calories, but it's also fried fat has uh, a lot of something that uh, that induces inflammatory signals inside your body and that is the ones that are going to make you gain even more weight and then another thing i want to bring out is that fried food uh, as much as it, as it tastes good it has really bad um uh, it makes you e want to eat even more uh so so definitely, I, if I were you guys, I would stay away from these uh, fast food, uh, such as McDonald's, especially French fries. Uh, they're really, really bad for you. Um, okay, now two important questions need to be addressed. Why do some people but not others become overweight and why is there uh, an epidemic of obesity? So, uh, well, this can really come down to both genetic and environmental factors. So something that we know is that the weight of the adopted children is more strongly correlated than that of their biological father, than that of their adoptive parents. And identical twins, including the ones that are kind of reared apart, they, they are more similar in weight um, than fraternal twins are. And, but this has to something to do with um, the genetics. Okay, now let's take a look at the second piece of the evidence, and that is the environmental influences. They also play a very big role in this epidemic, and as I pointed out already, it's obvious that from the fact that much higher proportion in the U.S. population is overweight uh, now than before, and then now since the introduction of all of these uh, fast food such as, as McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, um, Burger Kings, and all of these um, westernized food into China. Now, Chinese population is gaining more and more weight compared to how it used to be, right? So the environmental influence is definitely also um, very a very big player, okay? Because these food are, they are um, what your textbook calls obesogenic, which means uh, makes you fat, okay? Uh, so these food are, they, these are food are um, obesogenic, they're high fat, high sugar food, and they have a lot of salt, and they are in huge portions, okay? Uh, if there is something that you can, you can watch them. I don't know if it's available in China, but uh, if you can find it, it would be great. It's called, it's a documentary called Super Size Me. So if you watch that and you will have an idea how people get uh, really, really fat in the westernized diet. Okay. Now, that's 
take a look at another issue, and that is what is the outcome of these obese children? And I have to say that, uh, of course, you guys have heard of like the miraculous things when uh, the some of these obese children when they are growing up, and all of a sudden they became oh so handsome and so slim when they are going through a, a growth spurt. Okay, and I have to say that this is really only very there's only few of them that do that. If you were fat in your childhood, chances are you're gonna be fat later on in your life as well. And why is that? Um, the fat cells that are in your body, uh, when you are born, and and let's say when you were um, a child and when you're eating, they multiply like crazy, okay? And so when if you are obese as a child, that means you have more fat cells than a skinny person in the beginning and that means later on in life your ability to store fat is double or triple compared to uh, a thin person okay and there is also the distribution of something called the white fat cells versus the brown fat cells now the white fat cells are the bad ones okay the brown fat cells are the one the ones that are good that actually help you burn fat um, so if you were a kid and then you eat too much, this is very bad for you. And that means you're going to have a lot of white, uh, fat plus, uh, white fat cells that is going to make you much more likely to gain weight. And this is the, these are the people who you have heard from uh, other people. Oh, I gain weight by even just drinking water. Well, this is why, okay because you have a lot of fat cells and they're very sensitive to nutrients and then your body is just like a sponge whenever there are any nutrients coming they just suck up the fat and then they store it and then what happens is that you gain weight even when you eat a little bit and, and you have no energy so um, later on when you have your children please don't make them a fat baby um, because they will, they, they will be mad, very mad at you later on when they are in their twenties, when they cannot lose any weight, when they have a lot of hard time lose lose uh, weight. Okay. Now let's take a look at how do these children with obesity, how this can actually affect their brain development. So one thing that we know that is very clear from the literature is that the cognitive tasks, especially the ones the, the ones that are listed here, for instance, uh, executive function, uh, working memory, attention, mental flexibility, and decision making are all uh, being impaired in children with obesity. And on top of that, it could uh, the children that are obese, they could also face social stigma. So what is social stigma? This is when kids are being very nasty to you because you're fat, okay? And so, of course, this is, is going to end up in social rejections. And we all kind of realize that the fat kid in school, especially something like elementary school or in middle school, they get picked on uh, more. And... And this is true pretty much in everywhere um, in, in China or in US or in like other countries, okay? Uh, so this can end up in with social rejection, which makes the, the environment, academic environment for these children not very good. And what is gonna happen, this is gonna go down a negative loop. They don't like going to school because of that. Uh, they cannot make, well, not, I won't say they cannot make it, they have a harder time making friends because of that. Um, and they, because they feel that they're being socially rejected by a lot of these kids, right? So uh, childhood obesity, it definitely has a very negative brain development. And later on, uh, from this uh, social stigma, and as well as a social rejection from these child with obesity, they might later on have problem forming emotional bonds with um, 
a boyfriend or a girlfriend later on and they might have a negative self-image of themselves and because they don't see themselves as um, beautiful or handsome uh, even after they lost the weight and things like that so the all of these are going to have negative consequences on their psyche uh, after uh, they become adults okay now what can be done to reverse this now this is something that uh, there's been a lot of talks uh, in developmental child psychologists and what can be done for uh, child obesity. Well, uh, one thing that we know about child or children is that their frontal lobe is not very developed yet. So which means that uh, they you cannot reason with them. You can only tell them what to do, okay? And so that means that the first step really comes from the parents. But I have to say that there is a reason why these children got so fat in the, uh, in, in, in the beginning. And that's because usually their parents eat that way also. So this is something kind of like a, a negative downward spiral going from there because um, their parents don't control what they eat. And then therefore uh, they don't control what they eat and then they get really fat and then they get picked on, on at school and then they have this, um, they feel they are socially rejected, they don't want to go to school and as a fact, their, um, their performance in school and social life all suffer as a result. So this is something I have to say, if you really want to, to point the person who is responsible for that, that's, uh, it's always the parents um, for a fat child. Okay, and um, and you have to act, you as parents have to act as their frontal lobe to give them inhibition, say you cannot eat this candy, you cannot eat that chocolate, put that french fries down, and things like that. And the second thing is that you have to make this child exercise. So, so exercising is something that can really counteract this negative effect of food, uh, of wrongly eating food okay but um, and this also have to come from the parents because children at uh, when they're young they don't have the self-discipline to really keep exercising they don't have uh, the mental capacity to run a mile every day and stuff like that so and there are other like um promising intervention programs as well. Uh, so it, this includes the intervention delivered during a pediatrician, a pediatrician uh, visits. And so basically the pediatrician is gonna come to your house and then kind of review your fridge and then kind of uh, give you homework, say, can you please just put down everything that what you have eaten and of course, other things such as um, unplugging the TV uh, during dinner is also something that is good um, because a lot of the times, uh, a lot of times I have to say that once you eat in front of the TV, you just basically um, lost track of how much you are eating. Okay, and this is of course has very bad consequences on your uh, weight. And another thing is also uh, get rid of the junk food and because children love to eat junk food and they don't know any better. So this again falls on the parents. You have to be their uh, eyes and ears and you have to basically watch what they eat if you, if you have a child that is obese. And so I have to say that uh, you as a parent later you cannot just let your kid eat whatever he or she wants okay so we have talked about child obesity now let's talk about the other end of the spectrum and that is undernutrition okay undernutrition of course means also means malnutrition that means the kids that are not getting enough nutrients okay now undernutrition can contributes to about 50% of all death of children under five years of age in, in the world. Okay, and now the undernutrition, because they're not getting enough nutrients, this makes them more likely to get infections. This weakens the immune system 
and make them more likely to, uh, to die from these infections. For instance, if um, a child who is 10% um, under normal weight, he or she is more likely to die from diarrhea compared to the one that are normal weight, okay? And of course, not under nutrition, what is the source of that? That usually comes from things like poverty, being poor. Um, if there is a war, if there's a famine, uh, or if there's some sort of natural disaster, some such as um, a, a volcano disruption or a tsunami or earthquake and stuff like that, okay? Now, what I want to bring out is that the, the undernutrition kids they their brain development and physical growth are of course going to be stunted okay now in the shorter term their brain development is going to be uh, not as great as the children that are that get adequate amount of nutrition and in the longer term this can actually make them die okay so that's something that's not very good and because of this bad um, this stunted brain development their cognitive development, their social development, as well as their education is going to be stunted as well. So it's really, it's really make sure, uh, it's really important to really make sure that the kids that you're raising, they're not too fat or they're not too skinny, okay? Now let's take a look at what is the effect of uh, undernutrition, what malnutrition on um, brain development and cognition. So back then, uh, Cordero et al. Uh, they they did this study. You can see that these are some goji staining, okay? And you can see that in the normal weight uh, child, basically, what you can kind of see that their brain cells they look very normal, okay? They have a nice uh, triangular body and they have this nice apical dendrite, right? And they have nice basilar skirts like that, and when you look at their dendritic spines, you can see that the dendritic spines, as well as the, the branching point, they are, uh, you can see that there are a lot of spines, like over here, right, compared to the ones that are um, malnutrition. Now, the ones that are malnutrition, you can see that these cells, they, they really don't look very healthy compared to the normal ones. And you can see that their amount of the branching, which is compared this one with this one, uh, the amount of branching that is coming from the neuron is much more simple in the malnutrition kids compared to the normal kids. And of course, the dendritic spines, as I said uh, here, you can see that um, the, the, the dendritic spines, there are very few in the malnutrition um, kids compared to the one that are, uh, that receives normal uh, nutrition okay so this just goes to tell you that there are also a lot of manifestations that are occurring on the neuron side and 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 having like a bad nutrient uh, having a bad nutrition program where you're not eating enough this can really have a very bad consequences on the way that you're neurons are developing okay 